darkness. Because John says, if we walk in the light, you know, God is light. If we walk in the light, his light shows how terrible our sins really are. If we're saved and we're walking in fellowship with him, we're going to be sensitive. We're going to be quick to seek cleansing. Because honestly, my friends, his light, if you get close to the Lord and you follow after him and he's in the light perpetually and we're just walking after him, as we get closer and closer to God, our sins are in HD. And that light of God, who he is, he is holy and pure. And the closer we get to him, the more and more we realize that we are sinners and we need cleansing. That's the God that you and I have a relationship with. And then in this chapter, chapter 2, John gives another purpose for the letter. Notice he says it here. These things have been written, right? And underline that in your Bible. He says that you sin not. You know... God is trying to dissuade his children from being comfortable in their sin, from putting up with sin in their lives. And honestly, and you say, well, I don't get that. Why would, it seems like John just on a dime says all these things about God and then says, hey, 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 I wrote these things so that you sin not. And really this light bulb went off in my head as I I got to studying it. And I was wondering why he said that. Notice, follow with me, okay? So John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has just penned that there is present, continual cleansing available for all those who walk in the light. You agree with that? You believe that God can forgive your sins? John didn't want those promises that were penned to encourage us to sin. And as we we could phrase it this way, to abuse the grace of God. To abuse it. You've, you ever had somebody abuse your mercy? Abuse your long suffering? Abuse your grace? Think about Almighty God. God says, I'll forgive you if you walk in the light. And you'll enjoy a continual cleansing time after time. And you have a promise that every time you come to me, I will cleanse you. But if we're not careful, we can be encouraged to sin because, well, I'll just get cleansing later. Preacher, preacher, I know it's not right, and it flies in the face of God who is light, and this is darkness, and this is filth, and it's disgusting, and I know I shouldn't have it in my life, but I mean, I'll just ask for forgiveness later. Have we ever been guilty of that? I really want this. I'll just ask God for forgiveness later, because I know he'll forgive me. That's abusing the grace of God. This, this is what he's saying in this word. It's, an, it's, it's, an, it's just an awe, awe-inspiring thing we're reading tonight. You know, you think about it. In this life, none of us are going to be sinlessly perfect. And it's almost like the devil's like, hey, I mean, you'll be perfect one day in Christ, right? One day you'll, you'll have that glorification and you'll be in God's presence and you'll never sin. But, you know, just do what you want right now. I mean, nobody's perfect. I mean, just skirt on the things you know are are right. Do the things you know are wrong. And God will forgive you. Oh, God, deliver us from that attitude. And you say, well, hold on, Pastor. When you talk about sin, what are we talking about tonight? If you study that word, if you want to write this down, the word for sin comes from a word that means to miss the mark. Or to act contrary to the will and the law of God. You know, I also found, I didn't know this, but I, I did some research. You know that word sin can also mean to err. E-R-R, and I'm not a Latin scholar. Any in here? Okay, great. I'm not a Latin scholar, but I looked up. You know the Latin word for air means to wander or to stray? Did you know that? I didn't. So sin, if I could put it this way, my friends, is when we wander from the right way. When we deviate from the true course. And God does not want us comfortable with sin to be nonchalant. Why? Because it's evil in the sight of a thrice holy God. That's a pretty serious relationship you and I have entered into, right? God who is infinitely just, infinitely holy, that he is is light, he is the opposite of spiritual darkness, and you and I have this promise of continual cleansing, and John says, I'm I'm not writing these things so that you can abuse the grace of this awesome God. I'm writing these things so that you sin not. Man, it's such a convicting thing. God desires a fellowship with him where we would hate sin like he hates sin. Think about what God has given to us. He has given us the indwelling. And this is introduction. I'm not halfway through, okay? God has given us his indwelling Holy Spirit to empower us, to enable us 
to, to fight the, the, the corrupt passions and desires of our flesh and say, oh, Holy Spirit, I need your power. God, I need your power. Deliver me. God, God, I want to trust you. I want to love you. I don't want to give into these things. God hates sin so much. He literally gave us the indwelling Holy Spirit so that we would fight that fight against it. The, the God hates sin, my friends. Follow with me here. It's about that relationship. But what happens when we miss the mark? What happens when we do it? Oh, man, I shouldn't have said that. I wish I could take those words back. What happens when you and I miss the mark intentionally? When we decide, I'm going to do that. What happens when the weight of failure hits us after we sin? You ever been dragged low because of your sin? You ever just felt like you're the worst person ever? And it seems like your fellowship with God is so lukewarm. You ever been there? I hate to say it, but sin is going to happen. Because we live in a body of weak flesh and we live in a world of temptations. And there will be times, I just, I, I'm, this isn't Joel Osteen hour, okay? There's going to be times when we are not going to be willing to rely on Jesus Christ to deliver us. We're going to fall on our faces. That's going to happen. We're going to stray away. And if you're a Christian, you're going to be miserable under the chastisement of God when you've got sin in your life. And you might, you might say, I know God doesn't want me to sin. I know that he wants me to rely on his indwelling Holy Spirit to get this, vic this victory over passions. But you might say tonight, Pastor, but I've fallen this week. I've strayed away from my relationship with God. I know I'm, I'm promised cleansing. And, and pastor, I've confessed. I've come to God and confesses the idea of saying the same thing as. God, this thing in my life is not right. It's wicked. It's evil. It's darkness. It's the work of the flesh. God, I'm sorry. I turn from it. Please forgive me. But have you ever, uh, you know, owned up with God and asked for forgiveness and you leave and you still feel like the scum of the earth? You ever finish praying and your heart won't stop condemning you? You ever, you read it and you go, okay, I know I'm promised continual, continual cleansing. I'm trying to walk in the light. But the accuser is in my ear saying, you'll never, you'll never get over this. You'll never get victorious over this. How can God love a sinner like you? That ever happened to you before? You ever just been so lukewarm and so discouraged? How can I ever come back to God for messing up? Oh God, I've grieved your spirit. I've grieved your spirit by my life this week. I've abused used your grace more times than I can count. I can hear the accuser. I've confessed my sin. I've gotten right, but I still feel uneasy. Aren't you glad that our gracious God has given provision to that? Though our heart condemns us, though the, the enemy roars against us, the Bible says, here's what it says. And if any man sin, is that where you are tonight? I've fallen messed up. My devotions have been garbage. I've not loved my neighbor. I've, I've hated this person. I've murdered in my heart. I've thought the wrong things. I've watched the, the wrong things. And I've asked God for forgiveness. But I look over my life and it's the same things, the same pet sins, the same failures. And I've sinned. What do I do now? What does he say? And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. And that's what I want to preach on tonight. The title of my message, if you want to take notes, is We Have an Advocate. Let's pray. Father God, I come to you tonight by the precious blood of Christ. And I pour out myself before you, God. I am nothing. I am a sinner. I am, without you, I can do nothing, God. And Lord, I pray that Christ would be highly exalted. I pray for that person who is far away from you who's saved, but has still not gotten their life under your obedience. And God, I come to you and I ask for your precious Holy Spirit to work in hearts. And Father, I ask that you work in my heart. Uh, God, I need you. Uh, Lord, I, I am nothing without you. And I, I ask you to hide me behind the cross tonight. I give all these things to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. I'd like to give you three things about this phrase. We have an advocate. Number one, if you want to take notes. Number one, we have an advocate who represents us. We have an advocate 
who represents us before the Father. Look at that word. It's kind of cool. The word advocate, if, if you, if you want to be a nerd <laughs> and look up this word, as pastor says, it's the Greek word parakletos, okay? And it's interesting. It means one called alongside. It, it, the, uh, the definition is one who stands by to help or to render aid, especially in a court of law. Uh, another definition is it is someone who is summoned to the side of another to help, to comfort, to encourage, to counsel, to intercede for. You know, actually in the ancient world, if you study out this term, in a lot of pagan courts, the advocate was actually the friend or friends of the accused who all came before the judge and pleaded with the judge that they would find this person innocent in the old world. That, that's the idea of advocate. Uh, on a side note, if you really want to be nerdy, do you know this word parakletos is the same word that Jesus used in, I think it was John 16, referring to the Holy Spirit? And our translators accurately translated it comforter there. So it's interesting. It's the same word. And you say, hold on a second. It's the same word. You said it's accurate. Hold on, hold on. There's two advocates? Yeah, it's great. It's great. The Holy Spirit comes alongside us. He, he indwells us. He acts within us. Do you know he actually, when you're praying to God, he's the one that's helping you pray. He's putting pleas in your mouth. He's helping you inside of you intercede for yourself when we don't know what to pray the holy spirit is the one that's helping us pray and he's the one communicating he is helping us intercede as we come before god but my friends i'm not talking about the holy spirit it's wonderful it's wonderful we have an advocate that helps us pray we have an advocate that encourages us and comforts us but there is another advocate in heaven Wow, another advocate who is in heaven, who is before the Father right now, and he is in forever a fellowship with the Father. If you look at this word, look at this here. He says, we, we have an advocate, and underline this, with the Father, with the Father. You know what the idea is here? The idea is facing the Father. And I got to study in this. John 1, 1 says the same thing. And the word was with God. The idea here is we have an advocate who was and always is before the Father in perfect standing. Why is that encouraging? Because what happens when you and I lose fellowship? What happens when you and I uh, fall in darkness? What happens? We know we have an advocate who enjoys un broken fellowship with God the Father. Let me tell you something. You can mess up, but he doesn't. You can turn to the world and turn from, turn from righteousness. And, and I'm not telling you to do this, but I'm saying it just, it's a course of life. We get carnal and we fall and we turn. We, get, we take our eyes off of heaven. We take our affections off heaven. But there is an advocate who is continually before the Father, facing the Father, and his fellowship is unbroken. What? Oh, man, it, it gets better. It gets better when you think about this. And, and, man, when I read this, it was just like a claymore size, like dagger went in my heart. He will defend us when we fall. That doesn't sound right. Wait, wait. I thought God only defends me when I'm doing right. He's your advocate when you fall. Through Jesus, God can help us even when we mess up. And I got to thinking about that, and that tore me up. Let me prove it to you. How many times have you been away from God when you've been unfaithful to him, and yet he's been faithful to you? How many times have you been away from God, and he still blesses you? He still chastises you? How about when he provides for you when you're away from him? How about when he pours out his grace on your life? Where's that coming from? Where's that coming from? Where's that coming from? Is it you who's living in the world and, and, and racking up enough brownie points with God where God's like, well, I mean, you thought about me for 2.5 seconds. You picked up your Bible, but, eh, and at least you picked it up. I think I should bless you today. Where are, where's all the blessings? Where's the grace coming from? Can I tell you tonight, there is an advocate who is pleading your case even when you fall. And Father, they don't deserve it. But look at what I've done for them. Please bless them. Please take care of them please provide for them God take care of this need give them the grace that they need we have an advocate with the father right now 
Let me tell you, if you're away from God, I need you to hear something. Even though you're running from God, you have an advocate who is before the face of God calling out your name right now. You can run from God your entire life. You can let bitterness consume you. You can get mad at everybody. You can say, I don't believe it anymore. I'm, I'm running away from it. And you can say whatever you want. But I need you to hear something from the word of God. You have an advocate if you're saved. And he is calling out your name right now. And you are blessed because of your advocate's prayers. Think about it like this. He's not going to stop praying for you. He's not going to stop. Our defense attorney, our intercessor will never be disbarred. Amen, right? Amen. He'll never recuse himself from our case. Amen. You know what that tells me? You can't sin too bad for him to say, eh, I've tried my best. There's only so much I can do for you. Oh, wow. What a wonderful savior tonight. We have an advocate. You know, that's in the present tense in the Greek. Literally, he is our continual advocate forever 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 you have an advocate in christ if you're saved he's your continued advocate with the father and i don't know about you but the more i learn about god the more i study about his glory and his holiness and his presence and you think about how he descended on mount sinai you think about his shekinah glory that filled the temple in the old testament and it was so powerful it pushed everyone out of the temple and you think about in the, in, in the, uh, when, when Christ comes back to earth and it says that the Antichrist is going to be destroyed by the brightness of his appearing. This is a God whose eyes burn with a flame of fire. His face shineth like the sun in its strength. His, his, his voice is the sound of many waters. The infinite holy God. One of these days, you're going to stand before the infinite God. And it's going to take all of eternity to take him in. And to think that one day I'm going to stand before this awesome God and his holiness and his love and his glory is going to hit me like a Mack truck going 3,000 miles an hour. That's the type of God that we have access to. And sometimes there's a holy, healthy fear that says, listen, I'm going to stand before God one day and I want to hear well done. And sometimes you just look, I don't, and even as a Christian, as, as a saved person, it's like the thought of standing before God in his full revelation. It's kind of a daunting thing, isn't it? But we have an advocate who calls us alongside to him. Wow. He is our friend. He ushers us in. He argues for us. And he's pleading for us even when we turn our backs on him. He stands as our elder brother our Lord to his father and ours. Can I give you a quick comparison? And maybe if you've not really processed this. So we have a court setting here. We have an advocate calling the name of his friend, right? Of his family. That's our advocacy in Christianity. And if it doesn't hit you how awesome it is, can I give you a contrast picture? Think about another legal setting one day. It's called the Great White Throne Judgment. Think about that case. Think about that courtroom. Think with me. When you study your Bible in Revelation, it, all the lost who don't have Christ are going to appear before the court of the judge of eternity. And they are going to have to represent themselves before the infinite God. The Bible says the books of their works and their words are going to be opened. And the evidence is going to be without any reasonable doubt. Can you imagine the burden of trying to defend yourself against the infinitely holy God? You know, I got to studying this. Some, I think this is apropos here, but some people speak over, it's, it's estimated, 860 million words in their lifetime. It's the equivalent of a 20-volume Oxford English Dictionary. Some of you are double that. Okay? But you think about it. You, there's 20 volumes of works of every word of every sin, of every failure, of every wrong thought, of every you know, selfish ambition, the works of your life. If you don't know Christ, you have a court appearance and you are going to stand before the thrice holy God and have to defend yourself without an advocate. But one author said, he who was our judge in the court of his violated law is our father in another court, the court of grace. <laughs> my, my, my position outside of Christ is I deserve his wrath. What, 
What have I done in my life that I deserve to be declared not guilty? But because of Jesus Christ and my advocate, I have switched courts. <laughs> and I'm not in the court of violated law anymore. But I am in the court of the gospel, the court of grace. And his throne is the mercy seat. And his son, our savior, is our advocate. And he represents us. Aren't you glad, Christians, that you have an advocate who represents you before God the Father? But number two, we have an advocate who is righteous. We have an advocate who is righteous. Look at what he says here. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So not only do we have a, an advocate who stands before the Father pleading our case, but notice the title. He is Jesus Christ, the righteous. Have you ever just asked yourself, why did God put that in there? Why do we as Christians need to know his title of righteous? I got to studying this, and here's the answer. The title given to Jesus conveys that his character is infinitely righteous. And this is important. He is personally conformed to all the righteous demands of God's law. You're not. You never can be. But he perfectly fulfilled the law of God. He is righteous. Do you understand that? Okay. He is qualified to plead your case because he has kept all the requirements of God's law. Think about it like this. Only the righteous one. Only the guiltless one, the one that is separate from sin, can be an advocate with God the Father. Only Jesus Christ the righteous has access to that fellowship. No wonder Christ said these wonderful words that no man can come to the Father but by him. He's the only righteous one. He's the only sinless one. He's the only one who is capable and qualified. And I really want you to let this truth grip you tonight. If you can, by faith, just, just look, if you will. Look on the courtroom of heaven. Do you see your advocate there? Do you see him advocating before God the Father? Who are his clients? The clients are the guilty ones, but he is righteous. Their innocence cannot be pleaded. Their sins must be confessed. But our advocate does something for every sinner who comes to him for salvation. Their standing without him is that they're under the righteous judgment of God. All their works are filthy rags, but he takes their case. He took your case. You don't deserve it, but he took your case. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. And since you have no righteousness to plead this is important he pleads his own righteousness on your behalf you have nothing to plead but he pleads his own righteousness why because he alone has been righteous unto death he has been righteous for you for us he has brought in everlasting righteousness and he has credited he has imputed it to us in Christ so how does this help the believer can I give you something that hopefully will change how you think about your salvation and hopefully this is uh, this is a world changing thing do you know that your salvation your standing before God has never been about your your performance let me say that again. Your standing before God has never been about your performance. It's never been about your righteousness. Why? Because you have none. Right? Your standing before God is based upon his blood and his righteousness. It's perfect. That'll, that'll encourage you because as never, if you're saved, you have a testimony of being saved. Have you ever doubted your salvation? Have you ever noticed it's, did I do the right thing? Did I say the right word? Did I go forward with the right attitude? Did I, did I, did I, did I, did I read my Bible the right way? Did blah, 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 blah. It was me, 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 me. Your salvation is not D-O. Your salvation is D-O-N-E. Your salvation is based upon his works, his righteousness, his ability to save my friends. Why does this help you? Who is calling out your name right now? It is the infinitely sinless, perfect, glorified Jesus who is pleading for sinners. And this might come as a shock to you, but he's not like any attorney you've ever seen on TV. You know these attorneys? My client is innocent, your honor. He never did this. He wasn't even in the room. You know, Matlock comes in or whatever his name is. I don't know. I don't know. 
right? <clears throat> he doesn't, you know, in the courtroom of heaven, Jesus does a different type of, uh, of, of, of sermon or standing, or sermon, excuse me. He admits your guilt. He pleads what he has done on your behalf. He pleads his righteousness, his sufferings, his death on your behalf, and he credits to you his own righteousness. Can I tell you, if you come to the Lord tonight, the only way you can come is by pleading his merits and by pleading his righteousness. Amen. Lord Jesus, because you're righteous, I can be saved. Because you're righteous, I can be kept. Because you're righteous and it's based upon what you did for me at Calvary. It's your finished cross. It's your empty tomb. That is the only reason that I have standing in this courtroom. That's the only reason. And that is the only plea that will ever get anyone into heaven. It's not your works. It's not your baptism. It's not your communion. It's not how often you gave to the church. The only way a person can have standing before the thrice holy God is the righteousness imputed of Jesus Christ. Isn't it interesting how he says our advocate, his title is righteous. Amen. Number three, and we'll be done. My favorite point. We have an advocate who removes we have an advocate who removes. Look at the, the next verse, verse number two. He says, and underline this word, and he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. You know, John in this verse is, is adding to our confidence and to our trust in our advocate. And he uses this word propitiation. I don't think any of us in our daily lexicon use this term propitiation it's a it's an uncommon word in today's in today's life but if you actually study the word it's really cool here's the definition of it the idea of propitiation ready is that which takes away or atones for sin that which takes away or atones for sin when we think about propitiation a lot of people think about the pagan idea of propitiation. Historic, historical paganism, propitiation in their mind was, okay, I have offended these gods, and I have to bring my crop, I have to bring, you know, like a, a person to sacrifice their heart on the altar, because I'm bringing something to, to make all of the gods turn their anger from me. That's what pagan propitiation is Christian propitiation is entirely different what, what do you mean okay the best way that I could try to picture this to you is to use an Old Testament picture of this okay if this this word in the Greek uh, it's halasteron I, I always pronounce that wrong but basically it refers to the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. Actually, if you go to the Greek Septuagint, when they were translating the word for mercy seat in the Old Testament, they actually use this word that we use for propitiation because it means that it's the closest thing to it. So let me, let me just tell you what this is. So if you can in your mind, how many of you have ever seen a picture of the Ark of the Covenant or a drawing, not a picture, <laughs> if you tell me where it is. Okay, but if you've seen a drawing, that'll come next week, the joke. Okay, so if you've ever seen a drawing of the Ark of the Covenant, it's a, it's a, it's a long box, it's a wooden box, ornately, you know, decorated and covered in gold. And there are two golden, you know, the Bible uses the term beaten or, or, or crafted cherubim that are looking down at the ark, right? And in the ark of the covenant, that's where they put the two tablets of the law. They put the, the Ten Commandments that, that, that Moses, after he broke them, wrote down, okay? And the lid of that box or the lid of the ark was called the mercy seat. And that is where, okay, the ark was actually like uh, given to Moses because it's, it's supposedly, or actually it does, it is a mock-up of what God's throne in heaven actually looks like. It's the pattern, the Bible uses that term. So literally the pattern of God's throne, okay, you've got this this place, right? It's called the mercy seat, right? The top of the ark. You've got the angels that are looking down on God. And then God was enthroned on top of it. It's called the mercy seat. That's where his glory was. Okay. So if you ever study and just follow with me, if you study the old Testament, okay, in the innermost part of the temple, right? There was this veil and beyond the veil, there was the ark of the covenant and God's Shekinah glory was seated on this ark. 
And on the day of atonement, the high priest would come in, not without blood, the Bible says, and he would go to the ark, right? And he's, he's using incense and there's smoke because he can't look upon God, right? This glory, it would kill him. And he takes the blood of the offering and he sprinkles it on the mercy seat, the top of the lid, right? Between the two arks where God was seated. And on the top of the ark, the mercy seat, is where God uh, was atoned, the sin of the people was atoned for. So here's a picture. And this, this really, when I, I've never heard it this way, and it really changed how I looked at this. The blood is applied to the lid. The blood stood between God, right, and the law that was broken. So when God looked down, he didn't see the broken tablets, the, that people, the broken law. He didn't see the, the sins. He saw the blood. He didn't see the, do you understand that? When God, is, that's his throne. That's the picture of his throne. His glory is seated above the ark. And the priest came in and they offered and they confessed the sins of the people. They put the blood on it. And, and the top of the ark is, is, is God's mercy seat. It's the throne. And when God looked down, he didn't see the broken law. He saw the blood of the offering. And when he saw that, his wrath was taken away. Propitiation. If you don't know where I'm going, buckle up. This is great. This is a picture of Jesus Christ. What he did for us. Notice, he, we don't bring our gifts to God to remove his anger. You can't pray enough. You can't do enough. You can't be baptized enough. It's not your gifts that you bring to God. This is crazy. But God presented himself in Jesus Christ to turn away his righteous anger from us. God the Son put on mortality and went as our offering to the cross. There the infinite and holy God was punished in our place and all of our sin, past, present, and future, the infinite amount, the eternal amount of debt that we owed was paid by our infinite God on that cross past, present, and future. There, the sacrifice was accepted and the just demands of God's law were met. The just dying for the unjust. So catch this. You remember when Jesus proclaimed, it is finished, to talus die, paid in full? Because of the cross, because God's wrath had been appeased, forgiven, right? The debt of our sin was paid. So if you're saved, can I, can I phrase it to you this way? If you're in Jesus Christ, and I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, God's anger towards you is gone. Let me say it again. If you're in Jesus Christ, if you've been born again, God's anger towards you is gone. All of your sin is covered. Not just once a year, all of it. The perfect sacrifice took care of it. Christ, one author said, has become our mercy seat. He is the place and the means of our redemption. Think about it like this. If I could put it to you this way, when God looks down on you, he doesn't see your sin. He sees the perfect offering and blood of the son. Literally, Christ has become our mercy seat. What? But Lord, I mess up. God, I've messed up. God, I, I don't think what I should. I don't say what I should sometimes. And God, I, I give into the flesh. And Lord, Lord, the, 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 the adversary says that, God, I, I've messed up too many times. And, 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 and there's no way I can be forgiven. And God, you're probably still angry at me. I'm sorry I grieved you. I've confessed it. And, and I, I know you say that I'm forgiven. I know that you promised cleansing. But God... Surely, surely not. Surely. I mean, there's got to be something that I'm not doing right. Surely it's not just this. Surely I've got to give more money. Surely I've got to go to church more. Surely I've got to be the most super Christian that's ever been with God for you to be happy with me and, and accept me back in. And he says, but we have an advocate. 
Jesus Christ, he's righteous. He is righteous enough. He can, pre- he can plead our case because he pleads his own righteousness. And he is our propitiation. He has, through his sacrifice, all of the anger, all of the animosity for every wrong thing that we've done in our lives is gone in Jesus Christ. His blood is paid it. And you hear me tonight, when God looks at you, he sees the blood. He sees the perfect, righteous justice satisfied in Christ all obstacles to reconciliation are gone so here's the premise you can come to God in Jesus Christ and say Lord this is wrong I'm sorry for it and God I turn from it help me to live for you and serve you I'm so sorry I did this and I mean it Not, not half repentance God I mean it I'm sorry help me to live for you And I'm trusting, I'm asking this in the name of Jesus Christ, the righteous. I'm trusting. And you know what? When we sin and when we're right with him, he's still pleading our case. And you can come to God and he sees you, not with all your scars of sin, because the stain is removed in Jesus Christ. He sees the blood and the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ that's for the Christian but if you don't know Christ as your Savior if you've never been born again that's not your position without Christ you are separated from this glorious God and you will face him one day unrepresented there's no public attorney that will be given to you no angel can defend you right The best lawyer that's ever lived in this world couldn't be given to you and you defend yourself against all on the the evidence table. But if you come to Jesus Christ, if you you turn from your sins and you realize you agree with God what you are. I'm a sinner and my sins have separated me from God. I can't save myself. I'm not good enough. Actually, I'm, I'm worse. I'm worse than anybody says that I am. And I have no hope in myself But I believe that you died for me, Lord Jesus. I believe on that cross, all of my sin was paid for. And you suffered and you bled and you died for me. And I believe it. And I believe you were buried. And God, I believe you rose again the third day. And Lord, I'm asking you, I trust you. Please save me. At that very moment, you're washed. You're justified. You're brought into the family of God and forever at peace with God. And you get an advocate, Christ Jesus, the righteous, who is your propitiation. And God will never be angry at you again, not because of what you've done, but because of what Christ did, his death, burial, and resurrection. Let's have a word of prayer tonight. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I don't know where you are tonight. I don't know where you are. I don't know. The Lord, <clears throat> the Lord is, is working. He worked in my heart tonight. But maybe tonight your prayer life hasn't been great because you've listened to the adversary and said, surely, surely I can't come back to God. Surely I can't be revived. I, I, I've, I've, I've abused God's grace too many times. Can I encourage you tonight? You have an advocate. And he's been calling your name and he's been calling it all service to God. Maybe you need to take some time. The altars are open. Maybe you need to talk to the Lord. Maybe you want to pray at your seat and just have that time of just confessing and getting right with the Lord. Maybe you need to take some time and rejoice in the Lord tonight and what you have. But maybe tonight, can I ask? Maybe you came and maybe you've been coming for a while. But as the service went on and you've learned and you've heard about Christ, the Holy Spirit has testified to you that you're not saved. You don't know this God. That you've never been forgiven of your sins. You're not born again. You've never trusted personally the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Not your works, but him alone. And you say tonight with no one looking around, Pastor Ryan, I know this doesn't save me, but I'm really concerned about it. And uh, if you could pray for me, I'd really appreciate it. I want to I know tonight that I can have eternal life. Is there anybody here that would say, Pastor, pray for me? I don't know Christ as my Savior. If I died tonight... I'd go to hell. I don't have this eternal life. I don't have this advocate. And you say, Pastor Ryan, please pray for me tonight. Anybody here that would say, pray for me?